event is one of our Cox Center um, events that are being held this summer as webinars. And it's one of the ways that we're making coronavirus lemonade out of coronavirus lemons. In the past, we didn't do things during the summer and we didn't really do a lot of uh, live webinars. Um, we prefer to have people at our law school and those are always wonderful experiences with a lot of great networking. Um, and we did want our speaker today to have the experience of our hospitality. But because of the coronavirus, we're doing this remotely and yet we have hundreds of people that are tuning in to hear about this. I mentioned that I met our speaker today doing a work on piracy. Um, we were asked by the United Nations to help establish piracy courts in Kenya, in Mombasa, in the Seychelles, and then ultimately in Mauritius. And while I was there, I had the great fortune to meet today's speaker, uh, Satyajit Buelel. And Mr. Buelel, was appointed the Director of Public Prosecutions for the country of Mauritius in February 2009. As such, he heads an office with approximately 60 law officers responsible for prosecution services throughout the country. If you haven't been to Mauritius, it's basically for you Americans like the Hawaii in the Indian Ocean. It is an absolutely gorgeous place with wonderful people and, and a great government. Um, now, our speaker today is also the chairman of the Criminal Law Review Committee of the Law Reform Commission. And that means that he works on all the reforms in the criminal law area, um, that, and he's on the cutting edge trying to improve his country's system. He's also the editor of the Mauritius Criminal Law Review, and he's well published um, and very insightful. Since he joined public service in 19... 86. He has been a trial and an appeals prosecutor. He's been parliamentary counsel responsible for drafting legislation, and he's held various posts at high levels in the Attorney General's office. He's also represented the government of Mauritius in various negotiations at the international level throughout the world. Mr. Boulel also holds a master's degree in law from King's College London, and he was called to the bar in the United Kingdom at Lincoln's Inn in July 1985. So I first learned of the situation that Mr. Boulel will be speaking about when I wrote a paper about the controversy surrounding the United States base at Diego Garcia, which is um, part of this uh, island chain that we'll be talking about. And I wrote that back in 1982 when I was an undergraduate at Duke University. And I have to say, I'm totally amazed that the issue is still as controversial as it was then, nearly 40 years later. But Satyajit Buelel is an expert on this matter. And we are pleased to have him join us today to give him an update, to, to tell us you know, what's going on, what's in store, and what it means to the United States. So Satyajit, the floor is yours. Thank you and uh, good afternoon. I am very pleased to, to renew contact with uh, Case Western. Uh, post confinement, we've just been two, two months of confinement and I'm extremely pleased to say that uh, we are almost COVID free, but we, our borders remain closed. Um, I want to thank you personally, Michael, for, for this invitation. We have very fond memories of your visit to Mauritius, a very enriching one, and, uh, and uh, the lectures that, that you gave us. And I'm glad to say that our piracy uh, prosecution process uh, uh, has been and still uh, is, is a success. We have a very uh, effective uh, enforcement uh, process in Mauritius. We have not had cases for, for, for the last uh, two years though. Uh, let, me, let me, before I, I, I start uh, this uh, lecture uh, or talk, uh, perhaps uh, issue the, the usual caveat on, on this sensitive, or as you say, controversial topic, the views that I'm about to express 
are mine and mine alone, and they are based on the available facts uh, in so far as available. Uh, they, they do not bind in any way the government of Mauritius, the office of the DPP or any other person party for that matter. I would like to add one slight uh, uh, clarification. I'm not, I won't consider myself an expert on this subject, but certainly uh, I have a lot, a great interest uh, on, on this matter, perhaps as all lawyers in, in Mauritius. Uh, <coughs> Now, uh, let me start by saying that it is almost uh, 55 years uh, since the Chagos Archipelago was unlawfully excised uh, from Mauritius and it's a, it's a population of some 1,500 islanders deported to the islands of Mauritius and Seychelles in uh, very appalling, very inhuman uh, conditions in order to make way for the constructions of uh, a naval and military base on the island of Diego Garcia, as you pointed out. The excision of the archipelago uh, from Mauritius was in breach of the United Nations Charter and the principles of self-determination as applied and interpreted in specific UN resolutions voted by the uh, assembly. Uh, today, the, the historical uh, documents establish beyond doubt that the colonial government at the time deliberately concealed the existence of a permanent population on the Chagos Islands in order to avoid the scrutiny of the UN Decolonization Committee which imposes an obligations under Article 73 of the Charter on uh, uh, admi administering powers in respect of their colonies. The political and legal struggle for the return of the Chagos to Mauritius and for the islanders to be able to resettle on their ancestral homeland is still work in progress. The, the injustice caused to Mauritius and its community of islanders uh, clearly undermines the faith, uh, our faith, the faith of humankind in nations that claim to adhere to values of human rights, the rule of law and justice. But the the case of the Chagos Archipelago is not a case for despair, though. On the contrary, it is one of hope since Mino Mauritius has demonstrated to the world and to the African, its African partners that by appealing to the global community and by having recourse to the international institutions under the auspices of the United Nations, there is justice at the end of the tunnel. Last year on 22nd of May 2019, following the, an advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice, an overwhelming majority of the United Nations General Assembly voted Resolution 73-295, requesting the UK to return unconditionally the Chagos Archipelago to Mauritius within a six month deadline, which has already expired, and to cooperate over the resettlement of the former inhabitants of the islands. In addition, the resolution places upon all member states an obligation to cooperate with the United Nations in order to complete the decolonization of Mauritius. Now, in defiance of this resolution, the United Kingdom reiterated its standards argument that it is in no doubt of its sovereignty over the Chagos Archipelago and will cede the archipelago to Mauritius when no longer required for defense purposes. Concurrently, it argues that this is a bilateral issue as, uh, and gives for, uh, as example, the the yeah, proceedings before the arbitration tribunal under the UNCLOS, the 
UN Convention on the Law of the Sea and, uh, and insist that uh, the ICJ had no jurisdiction on the matter. This argument was obviously rejected by the ICJ. So for, for just to, to go into the, uh, this, the structure of, of this uh, uh, talk, uh, perhaps uh, I will cover very quickly uh, the background to the dispute, the, very briefly the arbitral proceedings before the UNCLOS, uh, which gave its uh, ruling in May in March 2015, the, uh, the advisory opinion itself uh, before the ICJ, which is uh, the le uh, entitled The Legal Consequences of the Separation of the Chagos Archipelago from Mauritius in 1965, uh, the question of consent, whether in fact Mauritius consented, and a conspiracy to de depopulate the, the, uh, the Chagos Islands. Finally, I will touch on the question of does that today constitute, uh, is there potential for a case before the ICC for crime against humanity? And then of course we will uh, perhaps go into the issue which I asked whether the United States doesn't hold the, the key perhaps to, to this issue by complying with Article 73, 295 and see to it that uh, uh, the, uh, there is cooperation for the complete process of decolonization. I must add here that this morning papers I'm reading that the ambassador, uh, Mauritian ambassador to the UN make a, a, a new appeal guaranteeing that uh, the, the continued existence of the, of the base on Diego Garcia uh, with a lease of 99 years and of course that Mauritius uh, exercise its sovereignty and, uh, and uh, start the process uh, for, uh, for the resettlement of the community of islanders. Can I perhaps ask Eric now to, to put the, uh, the, the, the map of the Indian Ocean so that some of the uh, listeners would be able to uh, quickly get a perspective of uh, the, the islands on the, uh, in the Indian Ocean. As you can see, Mauritius is 800 kilometers east of, uh, of Madagascar. Uh, the, it's, uh, the, the first settlers on Mauritius were the, the Dutch who named it after Prince Maurice van Nassau. Van Nassau. Here, uh, hence the name of uh, Mauritius. The French, took over the island in uh, 1715 and renamed it Ile de France. A number of uh, outer islands in the Indian Ocean, including the Chagos Archipelago, you will see the Chagos on the northeast of, the, of, the, of, of Mauritius, and uh, you, you can uh, spot the, the Diego Garcia Island. So were claimed, these islands were, were claimed by France and administered from Mauritius. They were always referred to as the dependencies of Mauritius and formed part of the territory of Mauritius. In 1810, the, the uh, British conquered the island from, uh, from the French. Uh, and uh, this was followed by the Treaty of Paris signed in uh, 1814, when France ceded the Ile de France, Mauritius, and all of the islands, all other islands, including the Chagos Archipelago to the UK colonial power. Uh, Mauritius obtained its independence in 1968 after the Chagos was uh, detached and made way uh, for a military base. Now, the, on the northeast, you will see the Chagos Archipelago. Uh, the main islands are are mentioned, Sa uh, Salomon Island, the Peros Banos, and the Egmont Islands. There are, uh, the Chagos Archipelago is made up of 65, some 65 islands, the most famous one, I've just named them. It is uh, in the, in the uh, middle of the Indian Ocean, flanked on the west uh, by Africa, and uh, the Southeast Asia on the east. 
Diego Garcia is the largest island of the archipelago, now of course site for, for a military, a naval and military base with an area of 27 square kilometers and accounts for more than half of the archipelago total land area. Uh, Mauritius the, uh, is in the southwest 2,220 uh, kilometer. Now, uh, the, the, sorry, can I, oops. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, the, in the, we know that uh, in the early 60s, at the height of the Cold War, the fearing the uh, arching uh, presence of the, of the uh, Soviet Union in the Indian Ocean, uh, the US and the UK entered a secret deal uh, to have a joint naval and military base on the island of Diego Garcia, precisely because of its uh, ideal strategic uh, location. Now we know that in the it's in the the, the 60s uh, is is very important because we had at that time a wave of decolonization. Many of the African countries, uh, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, uh, uh, Tanzania, 1961, Nigeria, 1960, uh, Caribbean countries, uh, Uganda also 1962, Kenya 1963, Malawi and Zambia 64, 65 and Botswana, Lesotho in 66. So there was a wave of decolonization. And at the same time, we know that the uh, UN General Assembly voted uh, resolution 1514 in December 1960 and proclaimed the necessity of bringing uh, to a speedy and unconditional end to colonialism. And of course, uh, one of the key paragraphs there was that any attempt aimed at the partial or total disruption of national unity and territorial integrity of a country was incompatible with the principles of the Charter of the United Nations. So, and uh, in, at, it was at the same time in that the UK took steps to detach. Uh, that was in 8 November 1965, the Chagos Archipelago and incorporated it in a new uh, colonial entity, the British Indian Ocean Territory, the Bayot. And immediately after that, we know that the General Assembly took the decision to pass Resolution 2066, which will be dealt specifically with the question of uh, Mauritius, uh, where they noted with deep concern that any step taken by UK to detach certain islands from the net uh, territory of Mauritius for the purposes of establishing a military base would be in, contra in contravention of resolution 1514. Resolution 1514 itself was, uh, was an interpretation of the, of the Charter of the United Nations and the principles of self-determination. So we, uh, at this was, uh, we are now in 1966, the deal was sealed, formalized, uh, UK kept the uh, sovereignty of the Chagos. Uh, the, the base, they started uh, constructing the base. The, the islanders were, were forcefully dumped. And, and I, I, I recommended that people watch the, the um, documentary by John Pilger on the stealing of a nation to see the, the, the appalling and the, the, the inhuman circumstances whereby this uh, the deportation happened. Now, Mauritius, soon after obtaining independence, started a campaign for, the, for retrieving, for the return of the Chagos Archipelago. The, uh, the, uh, the, there were several uh, questions. Uh, they, they kept open the, the issue of uh, the uh, bilateral talks, but the campaign on various international fora. But unfortunately, uh, uh, or fortunately, they, in, uh, 2000, in December 2010, diplomacy gave way to arbitration when following the creation of a marine protection area around the Chagos Archipelago, they, uh, it was totally uh, unilateral, arbitrary, 
uh, the the uh, the decision was to uh, to to stop any kind of activity uh, around the uh, the waters of, of the Chagos. Now, uh, Mauritius, and, and this had happened after the, uh, the High Court in UK had uh, decided that the, the an, uh, order in council uh, enacted by the Bayot uh, prohibiting any, uh, any form of settlement was, was lawful. Now, um, the, at the same time, the, uh, the, the, uh, the case was, was referred to the uh, arbit arbitration tribunal uh, uh, before uh, under section under Annex 7 of the UNCLOS, United Nations Convention of Law of Sea, on the grounds that the creation of the MPA was clearly in violation uh, with the obligations of UK signatory to the UNCLOS under Articles 2.3, uh, 56.2, and 194.4 of the Convention. Uh, very quickly, uh, uh, we know that 2.3 is about sovereignty over the territorial sea to be exercised subject to the rules of the inter of international law. The, the tribunal found there that uh, all the rules of international law meant that it was the uh, the, generals, uh, the general rule of international law that, the, that uh, I will come to this, the, uh, the undertakings given uh, by, by the, at the time by UK did not, uh, was not, uh, did not form part of general rules of international law. But let's, let, let, let me come perhaps today to the, to the heart of this case. The cornerstone of the, of the Mauritian case was that uh, the, the Lancaster House, uh, Lancaster House after the, the building where, where there were discussions of, uh, for the independence of Mauritius at the time when uh, the, the Mauritian leaders were meeting with the, with the, the English, uh, the, uh, the uh, colonial uh, uh, master at the time, they were negotiating independence, they, uh, and, and this is where the discussions took place in uh, in Lancaster House. So the cornerstone of the Mauritian case was the undertakings given by UK to the Mauritian Council of Ministers in 1965, prior to the detachment of the Chagos Archipelago. There were clearly documents have clearly shown that uh, there were uh, all kinds of tactics to apply pressure on the Mauritian leaders, being given that there was some pro-independence, some against independence, to concede to the detachment, otherwise independence of Mauritius uh, was going to be an issue. We will look at these, uh, at, at these documents in a while, but suffice to say that the, finally there were undertakings given and agreed by both parties that which included compensation to Mauritius for that detachment. Fishing rights would remain available to Mauritius as far as practicable and the archipelago would be returned when no longer needed for defense purposes. That was the, the lure, uh, the inducement given to, to the Mauritian leaders. And that the benefit of any oil or minerals discovered around, around the, the, uh, the archipelago would be preserved for Mauritius. So henceforth, uh, hence the, the, the free limbs uh, under the UNCLOS. But more importantly, I think that uh, the, the just to 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 cut short uh, the the uh, the tribunal the, the tribunal uh, was uh, took took the approach that uh, there were uh, there were competing uh, uh, considering the, the, the there's two uh, there's uh, two articles that there were competing interests that uh, between the duties uh, of uh, the coastal state, uh, United Kingdom, uh, which uh, exercised the right of the coastal state, and that uh, in, in taking measures to protect the environment on the one hand, and the rights and duties of other states to carry out the activities. Uh, whilst there were these competing interests were uh, existed, but it did not, they did not uh, release the United Kingdom from 
uh, acting in good faith and give due regard to the, to the interest of Mauritius, precisely taking into consideration the Lancaster House undertakings. And one of the main issues was the Mauritius was carrying out traditional fishing in the waters uh, of, of the uh, Chagos Archipelago. Uh, in, with respect to uh, Article 194, that uh, uh, they, 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 they concluded that not only uh, that since uh, fishing was an ongoing activity, they should, uh, that UK should give due regard with significant regard to these activities. Uh, the tribunal concluded that not only Mauritius was not informed of UK's initiative to create a marine protection area, but its fishing rights in the Chagos waters were interfered with and its repeated calls for bilateral negotiations were simply ignored. The, 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 the decision of the tribunal, unfortunately, did not bring the, the parties to, to the, to around the table, but in fact, the parties met before the International Court of Just, Justice and following the, uh, the, an, an advisory opinion in uh, which the, on the 22nd of June, the, uh, the UN General Assembly, uh, in accordance with Article 96 of the Charter, adopted Resolution 71292, uh, uh, asking for an advisory opinion from the ICJ on the following questions. Can I ask uh, Eric if he, if he can uh, uh, put the, the, the on the screen so that uh, everybody uh, the two the two questions can uh, can be visible to to the to the audience now. Right. Thank you. The, the, the two questions were no doubt uh, craftily and my, uh, drafted to ensure that the, that the ICJ would advise on whether decolonization, the decolonization process of Mauritius at the time of independence was complete an issue which was inextricably linked to the core question of sovereignty of Mauritius over the Chagos and what constituted the entirety of its territory at the time of its independence. The second question related to the consequences of the continued presence and administration of the islands by the United Kingdom and how it affected the resettlement of the Chagos Islanders by, by Mauritius. Now, the International Court of Justice proceeded by first uh, identifying in its analysis the relevant period when the dispute crystallized. In other words, from 1965 onwards, when the archipelago was detached from Mauritius, up to the time when Mauritius achieved independence, that was the 12th uh, March 1968. Once the, uh, once the uh, the relevant period was identified, the next logical step was to determine uh, the applicable rules of international law in the context of decolonization. And in fact, uh, I, I, uh, and this is, this is important, although the, 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 the court uh, pointed out that uh, the that since the breach was a continuing one, it would be relevant to examine the evolution of customary law from the date until uh, uh, until until the present date. So, uh, given the, the the flexibility of uh, the customary law, now. The, perhaps it's important to stop here, the context of, of, of decolonization, because 
uh, every colonial power, uh, every administering power has a, indeed a duty uh, to grant independence uh, to, to uh, a non-self-governing territory. And, uh, and this, of course, in compliance with the uh, UN Charter and the principles of self-determination. And uh, the principles of self-determination, as, as you would uh, know, that uh, they, they require themselves the, uh, the recognition, the involve, the recognition of the relevant unit of self-determination. In other words, the, the territorial integrity of the, of the, colon, of the colony that, uh, that is under administration. So that was the, uh, can I ask uh, Eric to bring, okay, to put this, yes, thank you. And, 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 and of course, that was the, 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 at the heart of, of the matter. And that is what uh, resolution uh, 1514 uh, uh, is, is all about. So uh, in order to, to decide that, the, the applicable rules, the, 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 the tribunal, the, the, the Court of Justice, the ICJ, resulted to a series of resolutions uh, adopted, as I mentioned earlier, in the early 60s. Uh, resolution 1514, uh, which was adopted in December 1960, was the key resolution in the context of decolonization. Uh, it provided for the aspirations of all peoples uh, to self-determination and their right to freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. Now, that in itself, it was applied in a series of other resolutions, uh, which uh, Resolution uh, 2066, uh, 32, uh, which identified the colonial territory, uh, the colonial territory of Mauritius and its dependencies as the unit of self-determination for the purpose of, of uh, uh, independence of Mauritius. So the Chagos was part of that unit of self-determination. Uh, the, the, the resolutions, uh, of the ICJ could not the, have been adopted uh, by the General Assembly in vain. That, that, that was a, a, an important uh, opinion expressed by the ICJ. Well, they, there was, it, it could, they could not have been up, uh, adopted in vain. And they referred to the case of the, the, uh, the, uh, the nuclear weapons case where the judges of the ICJ had already addressed the relevance of these resolutions and the fact that uh, the resolutions uh, adopted by ANGA would give rise to an opinio uh, juris. Uh, and, and in fact, they, 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 they stated, I quote, they can in certain circumstances provide evidence important for the establishing the existence of the rule or the emergence of an opinio juris to establish whether this is true of a given as General Assembly resolution, it is necessary to look at its content and the conditions of its adoption. It is also necessary to see whether the opinion juris exists as to its normative character. Now, resolution 1514, of course, provided such evidence and uh, the, 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 the they went further on uh, that uh, it, uh, it, it called uh, paragraph six of that resolution called that any attempt aimed at the total disruption of a national unity and territorial integrity of a country is incompatible, as I pointed with the purposes and principles of the uh, Charter of the United Nations. That decolonization process accelerated in 19. 60 with additional 28 non-self-governing territories exercised the right to self-determination and achieved uh, independence. 
it's clear that you cannot uh, dismember or dismantle the, the, a, 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 the unit of self-determination, the, the territorial integrity. So in, as I uh, pointed out again earlier, the question of resolution 22266, which dealt expressly with the fact that, that they viewed with deep concern steps taken to that this territory of Mauritius was being dismantled for the purposes of a military base and advised and invited the, the administering power to take no such action which would dismember the uh, territory of Mauritius and violate in, its integrity. So uh, the ICJ, the, 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 the learned judges of the ICJ also advised that both state practice and opinion US at the relevant time confirm the customary law character of the right to territorial integrity of non-self-serving uh, territory uh, as, a color, as a corollary of the right to self-determination. Having confirmed that right amounted to customary international law, the court stated that uh, the right to self-determination of people was defined by reference to the entirety of a self-governing territory. And, and of course, it also went on to say that there is no example that has been brought to the attention of the court, which following the adoption of Resolution 1514 uh, has considered as uh, lawful the detachment of the administering power or part of its non-self-governing uh, territory for the purposes of maintaining under colonial rule. We will, I will uh, uh, skip very, uh, go very fast on, on, on that. And as a consequence, they say that the, the unlawful detachment of the Chagos Archipelago and its incorporation into new administrative entity, the Barrett, the process of decolonization of Mauritius was not lawfully completed when Mauritius acceded to independence in 1968. Now, I will, uh, the court went on to enumerate a number of other principles, uh, concluding in turn that UK was an, an obligation to bring its administration of the Bayer to an end as soon as possible, and requesting the uh, General Assembly to ensure the process uh, of the completion of the, the decolonization and the resettlement of the uh, on the Chagos Archipelago nationals, including those of Chagosian origin. So that's the, the, the essence of uh, the resolution 73 to 95. Very, I, I, I don't know, uh, Michael, how I am doing for time. Uh, you, just, you, you just give me an indication so that. Yeah, um, why don't we go another five minutes so that we have at least 15 minutes for Q&A. Okay. So uh, very, very quickly, I think on the question of, of consent, uh, even, I mean, the, the argument is even if Mauritius ha has given consent, it was, it could not, the consent would be null and void, the, being given that, that this, was, uh, this, was, this was totally in violation of, of the charter. And, and in, in the judgment itself, the, the judges relied on the UN Committee of 24, the, Committee on Decolonization, which is that when the Council of Ministers agreed in principle to the detachment from Mauritius of the Chagos Archipelago, Mauritius was as a colony under the authority of the United Kingdom. As noted at the time by the Committee of 24, the present constitution of Mauritius does not allow the representatives of the people to exercise real legislative or executive powers and that authority is nearly all concentrated in the hands of the United Kingdom government and its representatives. So they had in no way they had, they, they had any legal capacity to enter into any agreement to, for the detachment of the, of the Chagos Archipelago, an accusation which was laid at the doorstep of the Mauritian leaders who negotiated independence at the time. So this also, the, uh, the, there was uh, no question of Mauritius having consented. The, the, uh, the detachment, as they said, could not therefore have been based on the free and genuine expression 
of the will of the people concerned. Now, as I said, I mentioned earlier, there was also um, a, a deliberate policy to, to conceal the existence of a permanent uh, population on the Chagos Islands. The, the, the historical documents which have come out uh, from the National Archives after, after 30 years clearly establish the, 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 the bad faith uh, of, of, the, of the colonial power, the imperial power, and the fact that uh, they've used this deliberate policy of, of deceit and concealment. Uh, from I just make the 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 the, the number the, the both from the international court of uh, justice and from uh, the cases before the high court in England they are replete with examples. Let me let me uh, just give you an example. Uh, uh, what what was said? Uh, for instance, they say that our understanding, great majority of these people are contract laborers, and in some cases, their parents. Uh, and a small number were born. The intention is, however, that none of them should be regarded as being permanent inhabitants of the islands. Islands will be evacuated as when defense interests require this. In the absence of permanent inhabitants, the obligation of Chapter 11 of United Nations Charter will not apply to the territory. They, they, they decolonize the Article 73. So now, uh, the territory is non-self-governing. Uh, in practice, however, it would have by the quiet disregard, uh, let's forget about this one as regards to the civilian population. Uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the colonial office wished to avoid using the phrase permanent inhabitants in relation to any of the islands because to recognize that they are permanent will imply there is a population whose democratic rights have to be safeguarded and which will therefore be deemed by the UN Committee of 24. These are historical uh, documents from exchanges between uh, between the uh, the representative in the UN and the the uh, uh, foreign uh, Commonwealth Office of the UK. So all these documents are are there, which clearly establish beyond doubt the uh, the, the question of of uh, to that the importance of depopulating the island and and concealing the the fact there was a permanent uh, inhabitants there. There is also the question which I uh, the question of crime against humanity. I, I raised this question, especially in the light of the uh, decision of the Rohingya people before the, the uh, uh, which was a, a decision given by the, by the pre-trial chamber of the, of the International Criminal Court on 6 September 2018. Uh, the first, there was a question of the jurisdiction but uh, and and what in uh, the the essence was that following the deportation of members of the Rohingya people allegedly uh, live in appalling conditions in Bangladesh and the authorities of Myanmar supposedly impede their return to Myanmar, preventing the return of the Rohingya people falls uh, within Article 71K of the statute under international human rights. No one may be arbitrarily deprived of the right to enter one owns country. Such conduct would thus be of a character similar to the crime against humanity of persecution, which means the international intentional and severe deprivation of fundamental rights contrary to international law. So even on the question of, of sufficient gravity, they say we must look at the quality of the, uh, by considering the qualitative dimension of the crime, not necessarily the, the quantitative uh, uh, aspect uh, of, of the crime. Now, uh, finally, uh, I would raise this thing of the, uh, as I, uh, the question of uh, why the U.S. Uh, should uh, should be supportive of the of the sovereignty. The question is not uh, was raised by uh, already by the U.N. ambassador uh, to the uh, the Mauritian ambassador from, uh, permanent representative to the U.N. Uh, this was in, given in, uh, in uh, the in National Interest U.S. magazine uh, that uh, it was at the time when there was a risk that there was a change in government, a Corbyn, a, 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 the government in U.K., and Mr. Corbyn was very supportive, has been, and still is supportive of the, of the Chagossians. But uh, this, this was uh, 
and this was also made to the uh, court, the International Court of Justice, and uh, the, the, uh, the reply to assurances given to Mauritius that there are no risks to the continued existence of the, of the base on Diego Garcia. The US made it known that it has no interest in entering into any arrangement with Mauritius to operate its base. So uh, the, uh, it is, uh, the US, of, of course, has already signed, as we know, a, a lease uh, going up to 2036 as respect to Diego Garcia. But uh, I, uh, I, I referred to Dr. Harris, Robert Harris, an assistant professor uh, of uh, political science at Colorado State uh, University, and he, uh, he argued forcefully for the fact that there should be, the U.S. should be looking towards Port Rice, Mauritius, and, and see for uh, whether there are possibilities of uh, uh, striking, uh, a, 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 in, uh, starting bilateral, bilateral talks and, 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 and uh, entering into a lease agreement uh, as long as Mauritius is, or as since Mauritius in so in as much is guaranteeing the continued existence uh, uh, of the of the base. Now, of course, the the Indo the Indo Pacific region now is very coveted by both India, China. There are the uh, the the there is uh, the the U.S. prob probably probably prefer to have the the Bayot a shield to, to cover its activities, but you know, things are changing. They, they, the geopolitical ball game is, is a very dynamic one, it's changing. The UK today faces Brexit and needs the, the support of the, the global community. The, uh, the question of human rights are all uh, issues which, uh, which is very much on the, on the uh, legal landscape. So, Perhaps these are issues to be to be to be put on the table, and and perhaps this is also a a a, a solution to this great uh, apart from the geopolitical aspect, apart from the fact that the uh, peace uh, in the Indian Ocean, there is also this human tragedy, the dimension of uh, uh, islanders who have. Uh, uh, been deprived of the ancestral uh, homeland. And I think they, uh, the, uh, the world owes it to them to see to it that there's a just solution at the end of the day. I'll stop here, uh, Michael, I, <laughs> let's uh, to just uh, give some time to, to, uh, for questions and, and, uh, and I'll do my very best to, to animate this. <laughs> well, Satyajit, let me start by applauding you. That was a wonderful run through of a very complicated case. Um, I'd like to use the uh, chair's prerogative and ask the first question while yeah. other people are starting to uh, insert their questions into the Q&A or the chat. Um, and, I, and let me first of all recognize that there have been questions about the CLE and that um, information will be posted at the very end of the program in about 10 minutes. So yeah. the first question is this, the United States has indicated on a number of occasions how important this military base is to US security. Um, they've even said at one point that it is um, the equivalent of an unsinkable aircraft carrier group. And others have compared it to the importance of Midway during World War II, Midway Islands. I mean, it's, it's important to the United States. So you said that today the ambassador to Mauritius went to the UN and said, we're ready to lease this out for 99 years, like um, Cuba has done with uh, Guantanamo Bay, leasing to the United States also for 99 years. I'm wondering um, what you think the obstacles might be to the US accepting that deal. Uh, for example, I know that Mauritius um, is part of a nuclear free zone and the US might not want to uh, confirm or deny whether it has nuclear weapons at its most important military base in the area. How do you think that might play out? Uh, the, just, just one small clarification. The, the ambassador made that to, to an, uh, a forum where this was discussed, but 
it's all recorded in the papers that it has renewed uh, this proposal to the US. Uh, it is a fact that uh, more and more uh, the, the attention is being turned to the US uh, in the hope that uh, they, because they, they have more at stake there and in the hope that uh, some, uh, they, they prevail over the UK and, and for a just solution. But, but you know, since that time, since they, uh, we are talking since 1965, I think we do realize, especially uh, countries around in the Indian Ocean region, that the Diego Garcia has played a key role in, in, in a number of conflicts. Uh, the first, uh, first Gulf War of 1990 to 1991, the, uh, the Operation Desert Fox, the, the post 9-11 invasions of Afghanistan and, and, and Iraq. So they, 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 today with the emergence of other, other superpowers, other important uh, military powers, I mean, China, India, so, uh, they, they, it is something perhaps which, which uh, uh, whatever be the, the, the issues, there need to be some form of equilibrium in, in, in all this and uh, uh, in, in, in all these uh, relationships. And uh, I think the US doesn't want to be viewed also as a rogue state. It has been, the US has been an example, has been uh, in, uh, uh, in its history uh, for human rights. Of course, uh, there have been also the dark side of its, of, of its history, violation of human rights. But in the international field, I think uh, they should, uh, they, they can, and, uh, and, and uh, they, they, they should be looking at what the, the institutions of the UN, the, why the, the, the founding fathers of the United Nations, the charter of the UN, otherwise, the international law would be a vain word if there's no adherence to these values. And I don't think uh, we need to see double standards. The, the US is, is making uh, a great defense of the egos in, in, in China, of the violation. And, and the world applauds the US for that. But they cannot have double standards. Just as the UK cannot have double standards, uh, to go and and uh, to the to the rescue of the Falkland Islanders, to preserve uh, the the right to self determination. So I think the people should, if we want to live in this in this world where uh, which which respect human rights, I think everyone should come to terms with this. It's it's a more political thing. I'm just, uh, but these are what what we need in this global world if we look for peace and, 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 and stability. So I'm curious about the number of uh, people that we're talking about here. It was 900 in 1965. I'm sure that population has decreased quite a bit as it's aged, but are we also talking about their descendants? Yeah, we, we I mean, the, the, the latest uh, survey is about 1,500 to uh, I, I think around 1,500 to 2,000. I, I, I don't think we are taking more than that. And as I say, if you look at the, at the spread of the islands, even though they have always argued, that was argued before the, the House of Lords uh, in UK, the highest court, when the, the, the uh, community, the Chagossians, took uh, UK to, to, to seek justice and, and the right of return. The, the, the U.S. Uh, intervened to say that it was a question of they won't want uh, the, to undermine the security of the, of the base by allowing resettlement on the other islands. There have been uh, feasi feasibility reports by the, by the government of the U.K. where they've come up with questions of... Uh, security and also uh, that uh, prohibitive, that's very expensive for resettlement and also the risk to the, to the marine environment. I mean, all these were found to be, to be very poor excuses. The distance of, the, of Peros Banos and Solomon from Diego Garcia would cannot in any way put at risk uh, the, 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 
uh, the base in Gegugasia? No, because we have already people from different uh, parts of the world working on, on the base in Gegugasia. So this, uh, I think, uh, the, we know this cannot go on, this, this policy of, of, uh, of concealment. Uh, uh, I think uh, enough has been said by the highest authority of the UN to, 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 for the world to understand that uh, if people want to have faith in countries that proclaim to be democratic, who believe in values of freedom and justice and liberty, then uh, I think uh, there is not, it's not a very difficult decision. So Satya, there's a question that we received that's really fascinating. Given that um, Diego Garcia is an archipelagic atoll, um, the question is about how the sea level rising might affect the, habit, uh, the habitability of the islands. Well, uh, this this is a very uh, this 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 is a very uh, uh, interesting and and a very credible uh, uh, consideration. Uh, but uh, uh, the the feasibility uh, uh, and the that was study that was made, uh, I think uh, it does not uh, it does not prevent uh, a short term solution. But it is certainly a consideration. Maldives is facing a similar consideration. But, but of course, uh, I'm no expert. Uh, I mean, this is a, I agree that this is a, a very important consideration. But once all parties sit down, and, and, and first of all, we have to agree that this it's the, it's the homeland of the islanders. Once we agree with this, perhaps yes, of course. But we are not there yet. We are not even giving them the right to their ancestral homeland. But I agree, this is a very important consideration. I, I wonder what the um, precedent would mean for other countries around the world. Now, I know that an advisory opinion isn't binding on other countries, but nor are ICJ cases generally. Um, but, you know, the narrow confines of this case is basically that where you have a colony with a dependency, you can't just give away the dependency, yeah. essentially. How many other situations are like that around the world where this might apply? Well, I, <laughs> I don't think I can help you with that, uh, uh, Michael. I, I have no, no clue where this uh, this. Uh, this would be, um, I, you know, I, I know the, the, all I can tell you, the Italy at one time uh, just decided to annex Ethiopia. I think this is an old case about this. And, and you, you, you cannot, uh, you, you simply cannot uh, do, 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 do such action uh, uh, contrary to the principles of self-determination. And I, I know there's a, but I would not be able to, to help you here. The, I mean, the other place I was thinking of is um, when the United States was experimenting with its nuclear tests in the Pacific, it yes. took a lot of people out of Bikini Atoll in that area and relocated them. And they've never been able to return, obviously. It's contaminated. Yes. Um, but it seems like there are some parallels to this, the right to return the forcible migration of local and, inhabitants. Yeah. I'm sure, and, and as you see with the, with the latest uh, uh, decision uh, on, in the Rohingya case, uh, again, there's, there's a, this, what is extraordinary that uh, it's a very dynamic process. The, the law is also uh, evolving accordingly. And, uh, and, and, and I think it's, it's going to be a very important uh, uh, precedent on, on, on and, and the, the, it's, it's, a, it's a logical next uh, uh, step as to, as to the, the decision of the ICC. And, and, and you, you can see some parallels there as to the right of return of, of these people to their, their ancestral homeland. Yeah. Uh, especially they, they go back to, to five, five generations. Uh, but it's, if, 
I think the, at the root of it, we, how can, what civilized nations, how can they have a policy of quiet disregard? How can they turn a blind eye? What is the cause? No one is, I mean, I mean, Mauritius is taking a very pragmatic approach. It's, it's saying, well, we are not in any way questioning, but, but there, there is a finality. There must be a finality to, 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 this, uh, to this question, the, the, which, which we, have, we have now had the, the enlightenment of the International Court of Justice. So uh, it is time to, to come to, 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 to the law, to, to respect the, the, the decisions of, of these institutions. Otherwise, what's the point of having the, the international rule of law or, or for any other matter, the, uh, the process of, of going to courts of justice? I think that's well said. Let me um, conclude since we're at the end of our hour by reading the last uh, comment that we just received. Um, this comment says, quote, very enjoyable and informative presentation. I am a retired Navy officer, and I understand the immense significance of Diego Garcia to our country's defense strategy, but I was unaware of this important legal issue. Thank you for inviting Mr. Bulel to speak about it today. And, and we are so grateful that you were able to zoom in with us and really enlighten us about something that many people don't know about in the United States, but is very important to our national security, but also, as you say, to our sense of international justice.